when Marianne and I first started dating and got married, there was a little bit of a cultural shock because Marianne is half Filipino and her mom is full Filipino. And of course, she has very, a lot of Filipino relatives. Um, she's like related to everybody from the island she's from or her, her mom is from. So everybody's cousin and auntie and everything, you know, so it's kind of hard to keep track of all the relatives. But something that I learned in this cultural shock, not only was the food, but um, was the, the going to somebody's house and then at the entrance, you take your shoes off. Now, this was not what I was used to growing up. In fact, it felt quite vulnerable taking off my shoes and I knew that I had stinky feet in general. So when you're dating a girl, uh, that's the last thing you want to do, right, is take your shoes off. But that is the culture of many Asian families. And probably you don't have to be Asian to have this culture. How many of you guys take your shoes off at the door? Wow, it's really spreading, man. <laughs> but here's the deal. It shows respect to the family to take your shoes off. And it makes you acceptable, especially to the mother of the house when you're not tracking dirt through. And it reflects the value that they have of not only respect, but clean floors. Now, we're talking about today entering the house of God. If we were to come to the front door of God's house, how should we enter? That's, that's kind of the thought that we're looking at today. Some scholars consider this the structural center of Ecclesiastes. And if it's not the structural center, it, perhaps it could be the theological center of the book. We've been looking at everything under the sun being filled with vanity, but there's one exception on this earth, there's a sacred place where eternity meets the temporal, where heaven meets earth, a holy place set apart, and it's called God's house. A place where we leave vanity at the door, and we enter a place that should never be empty, but always full of a heart of worship, always full with things that will last forever. As we cover this passage, maybe the idea of sacredness is as strange to you as it was me taking my shoes off at first. A cultural shock. But I would ask the question, have you lost your sense of reverence? Your sense of what is sacred? Uh, forgotten, there's still a place to take our shoes off, so to speak. Now, at the burning bush, Moses was told this. He, he saw the burning bush, and he came close, and God spoke to him, and he said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, because the place you're standing is holy ground. And so we leave behind our dirty shoes, the things of this world, as we enter God's house, because this is a holy place. Wherever God's people are gathered together to worship him. We see the importance of sacredness in the temple itself. In the Old Testament. The temple increased in sacredness the closer you got to the Ark of the Covenant. Which is called God's throne. He, he was enthroned between the cherubim. And so you would begin by going to Jerusalem. It's a set apart city. Still is on the face of the earth. And then you would make your way to the Temple Mount where you would enter one of the many gates. And then upon entering a gate, you would begin walking in the outer court. And if you were allowed, you would move into the inner court. And then the priests alone were allowed to go into the holy place. And then only the high priest once a year could go into the most holy place. And so we see this concentric circles of holiness and sacredness. And God had put that in the temple. And it was also pictured in the Garden of Eden, by the way. 
which man was barred from because we sinned. And so we were kicked out of the sacred space until Jesus died on the cross. And then the temple and the curtain was torn from top to bottom. As if the father is saying, because of my son's death for you on the cross, you now have access again to my presence. But as Christians, we still enter knowing that this is a sacred moment, that our God is a holy God. Chapter 3 began to reestablish our reverence for God in, a, in verse 14, where it says, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing he does is vanity. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. And so we begin to hear of this idea of fearing God. And that verse tells us because he's sovereign and in control and the only one who really does anything that isn't vain, we should fear him. Today we learn to fear him because he is holy. He is pure. He is completely other is another way to say holy. He is, there's nothing like him. Everything else is created. Everything else is contingent on his, God's will for their existence, God is totally other, and he's totally pure. So with that, we begin in verses 1 through 3 to learn that it is far better to draw near to listen than to speak. And like I told our prayer time beforehand here, that you would think this would mean I would teach shorter today. But the point is we come to listen to the word of God, not to Pastor Dale, right? To the word. And so that's, (laughs) that's why I speak for a longer time. (laughs) Yeah, that's my excuse. Okay. In verse one, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. We begin with the idea of guarding. Guarding. It means to diligently pay attention and to be mindful of your steps. That we are to have an attitude that is careful and reverent. So guard your attitude. Guard Literally here, your steps. Um, The word here is foot in the Hebrew, but it's figurative, as we see in the New Testament. Your walk speaks of your lifestyle, your conduct, and the the same thing is true here. Watch or pay careful attention to your conduct, how you behave. Make sure that you don't walk off course. Make sure you stay on the path. Uh, Psalm 1.1 tells us, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seed of scoffers. Because when your feet wander off the path, you find yourself sitting in a place that is not good, that is not reverent, that is far away from God. And so we guard our steps. As people say today, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Approaching God is dangerous. So be careful. What's going on in your heart when you approach God? That's that's the main issue at stake. Not whether you're wearing shoes or not. Not whether you have a tie on or not. The main issue is what's going on in your heart and your life. How are you treating your spouse, your kids, your neighbors, your coworkers? And so it says, draw near. And as we draw near, the idea is approaching with reverence. People should approach God's presence carefully, honoring him as holy, not forgetting the specialness of the moment. We approach him with humility of being aware of our own frailty of our own um, need for mercy and grace. 
In James 4, 8, it says, draw near to God, just like it says here, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. He'll meet you there. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so, in a sense, we take off our shoes (laughs) and leave the dust and the dirt behind, and we draw near to God, and he meets us. He draws near to us. That is his mercy and his grace. And we're always so thankful when we think of the fact that God longs to meet with us. Um, It may be dangerous, but it is the best place for us to be. And then in the context of this whole idea of drawing near with reverence, it says to listen is better. To listen is better than sacrifice. Listen is the Hebrew word shema, which maybe you've heard that word before. We'll talk about that in a second. But it means to hear with intention, not just to overhear or have your ear respond to vibrations, but rather effective hearing resulting in understanding and obedience. Like if your parents have ever said, did you not hear what I said? (laughs) We understand that the hearing includes doing. And so we have the Hebrew Shema, which is in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That is the greatest thing to hear and do is to love the Lord your God with all that you are. And it goes on that God's commandments were to be written on their hearts and they were to teach them to their children and talk about them together. Why? Because they love the Lord their God and it penetrates every part of their life. And so instead of their life being fragmented and having a wall up between church life and work life and home life and whatever it is, those walls don't exist. They're broken down and our love for God goes from the sanctuary outward to every small part of our life. To listen is better than to offer sacrifices of fools. Okay, now I want to share with you that when I was younger as a married young man, I would offer my wife gifts of fools. And what I mean is that I gave her what I thought she wanted. And I, one time for our anniversary, was very proud of myself that I thought of the best, most practical gift that any wife would want And when she opened it up, she found a brand new vacuum. I was like, yeah, that is, that is good. But little did I know, and this was my first lesson in this, I think, that I can remember anyway. I'm sure I had plenty of lessons. But my first lesson in that, you know, it means I actually have to listen to her and learn what she likes. The gift means more. Um, Same idea with romance, men. It's not about what you think is romantic. It's about what she thinks is romantic, you know. And when you know how she thinks, you know what pleases her, then there's happiness. (laughs) Or if you don't listen... (laughs) There's not happiness. And when mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. (laughs) God desires that we would not offer the sacrifice of fools. That means we come to God and we give him what we want to give him, what we think he wants. And we just override any idea of saying, well, God, what would you want from me? Well, we learn in Scripture, God desires mercy, not sacrifice. In Matthew 9.10, and as Jesus reclined at table in the house, 
So here they are in a house with God himself in human form. And behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus. Oh my goodness, how could they violate such a holy moment? And his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. If we truly understood God's heart... A sacrifice could be wise and acceptable if it was given with a life that was loving and merciful. But one who hates his brother and is not merciful to others, and they come and offer a sacrifice to God, it becomes unacceptable. It's a sacrifice of a fool. Thinking that outward religion would impress God and make him happy with them rather than a life of obedience or a life that reflects God's heart. The fool offers insincere sacrifices that are disrespectful because they're not thoughtful of the Lord. It's a sacrifice given on one's own terms in one's own manner. Here, God, you'll get this. (laughs) This is what I want to give you, you know. In Proverbs 15, it says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. And I like how um, Roglin says in his commentary about this verse, it says, This verse is a vital reminder that even the most religious of actions can be performed with sinful intent. And our motives must therefore be carefully scrutinized in the light of God's word. And so we have stories of people that approach the Lord and offer the sacrifice of fools, like Cain in Genesis chapter 4. It says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel in his offering. He was pleased. But for Cain and his offering, he, was, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry. Well, that's a strange response. Shouldn't it be sorrow? He's angry. His face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. And so Cain was so angry and he was so upset that God didn't accept his sacrifice in the way that he wanted to give it, that he killed his brother over it. The first murder happened in the context of worship. Pretty brutal. There's another man named Saul who offered a sacrifice that was not acceptable. At one point, Samuel, the prophet, told Saul, I want you to wait for seven days, and then um, you're going to go to war against the Philistines. But at the end of seven days, I'm going to show up, and I'm going to offer a sacrifice on your behalf. And seven days went by. Saul noticed, it says this in 1 Samuel 15. Or actually, I thought I had another verse in there. But Saul noticed, I'll tell you the rest of the story. Saul noticed that people were starting to leave. The soldiers were like, man, Samuel's taking too long. And he started to get nervous. And he feared the people. And so he decided to offer the sacrifice himself in his timing, in his way, and that didn't go over real well with the Lord. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, 
And Samuel says, has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? You know, God's not impressed with the sacrifices if you don't obey. Uh, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. What a bummer. Interesting that rebellion is likened to divination. And presumption is likened to adultery, idolatry. Divination is when you perform certain religious rituals designed to manipulate supernatural powers to reveal secret knowledge, like the future and whatnot. Idolatry, again, is about manipulating spiritual powers to obtain a specific result. But what happens when you approach God thinking, I'm going to manipulate God to get what I want. I will worship God if he gives me the benefits I'm looking for. You see, that's only obeying God when he, on your own terms. If you are worshiping the Lord and giving to the Lord only because of what you get out of it, Beware. That is the sacrifice of fools. And it says here, for they do not know what they are doing, that they are doing evil. Um, At the last part of verse one, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Fools have lost their moral compass because they have not listened to it for so long. They've learned the way of hypocrisy. Maybe they've even been encouraged or affirmed by other hypocrites and so they think what they're doing is acceptable and it may be to the crowds but not to the Lord they don't know what they're doing because their hearts have become callous because they have lost the sense of what is sacred and forget that one day they will give an answer for that David Gibson says this in his book, Living Life Backwards, when verse 1 says that such fools do not know that they are doing evil, it's referring to the kind of people who become so used to playing games with God that they no longer expect religion to be anything else. The sham is normal. It's just the way it is. And there's been no lightning bolt from heaven, so it must be fine to keep Trundling along like this. And such is the way of a fool. But we're called to put aside our foolishness. You know, if this has been your way, recognize it for what it is and just tell the Lord, I'm, I'm so sorry that I would think that I would tell you what to do. <laughs> that I would come into your presence presumptuously. One of the ways that we know we're doing that or not is how we use our words. And in verse 2, it continues on. It says, be not rash with your words, um, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. So here's the gist of it. Before uttering a word before God, there's a couple of things to guard. We were first guarding our steps. But now we're to guard our mouth and our hearts. Guard your steps, your mouth, your heart. So the second, guard your mouth. Control the words that jump out of your mouth. (laughs) It says here, be not rash. And to be rash means to utter sudden words of an emotional, thoughtless, careless manner. What comes out of your mouth when you hammer your thumb by accident? That's a rash word. (laughs) What comes out of your mouth as you're driving on the freeway in traffic? That's a rash word. Um, So where to guard our mouth? What jumps out of it? You know, stop stop it before it comes out. In Psalm 141.3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. 
Proverbs 13, 3, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his mouth comes to ruin. In the New Testament, in James chapter 1, it says, Know this, my beloved brothers, not every person, or let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It won't produce righteousness in your life, nor the lives of those you're angry at. And so we're quick to listen, slow to speak. It's been said, you have two ears, one mouth, use them proportionately. If you're a math person, that, that's a good, good proverb for you. Okay, two ears, one mouth. All right, proportionally, I get it. Fools don't listen because they think they know it all. They believe that what they have to say is more important. And so they can't stop talking. But we're told, guard your mouth. Uh, thirdly, guard your heart. Control the words that flow from the heart to the mouth. Because that's the order in which it happens. It begins in the heart, it goes to the mouth, and it comes out. And so be not hasty with your heart, which is hasty. In case you didn't know, it means to act in a hurried or rushed manner. Um, And so here's the way I like to think of it, is slow your heart down. When it begins pumping, and it starts throwing up all sorts of ideas that want to come out your mouth, slow your heart down before you speak. In Matthew 12, Jesus said this, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. And he's coming against the hypocritic Pharisees. He says, you brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of the good treasures bring forth good, and the evil person out of the evil treasures bring forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. That's some serious accountability that should shake us to the core when we think of, man, the things that can come out of our mouths. But you know, it starts in the heart. What are the words you say in your mind? What are the words that you want to say, but you know aren't the right ones to say? That's where it all starts, in the heart. And so when we are in a sacred place like the presence of God in his throne room, be careful what comes out of your mouth. If you have a hard time with your mouth in the world, and then you come into God's house, how much more careful should we be? And then we're reminded that God is in heaven and you are on earth. And this phrase gives us the idea that God is so big and you are so small. He is infinite and we are finite. Solomon, who writes the book we're reading right now, he had the privilege of building God's house. And so he has a special knowledge and relationship to God's house in the Old Testament. At the prayer of dedication for the temple, when it was fully built, and all ready for uh, people to meet there and pray and for the priest to minister, he did a prayer of dedication saying this, um, 1 Kings 8, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I've built. So he kind of blows the roof off the temple for a moment to remind you that God is even bigger than this temple. 
He fills the universe. And he doesn't just fill it, he is beyond it. He's what the theologians call transcendent. He exists outside of it. If God is that big, and he is everywhere, is there truly any unsacred space? But when we realize God is in heaven and we are on earth, therefore let your words be few. It would be foolish to speak too much and to listen too little in God's presence. As one person said, simplicity safeguards sincerity. Keep it simple. Say what you mean and mean what you say. And Jesus challenged us when we pray in Matthew 6, 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. No need to impress God with great and powerful speech. (laughs) When you pray, pray simply, pray sincerely. In Luke 11, verses 2 through 4, we see the Lord's Prayer. And I'm choosing Luke's version because it is more simple. And this really jams people's gears. When you're used to Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer, um, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And isn't it tempting to think, oh, that's not as good as the other Lord's Prayer. There's not as many phrases. And we judge one another that way when we pray sometimes, you know. Oh, yeah, so-and-so is so good at praying. But who are you praying to? Simplicity safeguards sincerity. If you pray simply, you know, it's really hard to be there to impress people. But God knows the heart. He knows what you need. Let your words be few. Now for a proverb-like truth in verse 3. It says, for a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. Now this proverb can be taken a couple different ways. One, some people think of a dream as being a literal result of the business, you know, You're involved in so much business that you dream about it. But it probably more likely is the idea of a fool's dreams drive his business. Where the dream is more metaphorical. His thoughts, his plans, his boasts about what he's going to do. Um, In the New American Commentary, it says, those who have many troubles may fantasize of performing great and noble acts, but their aspirations are meaningless. Similarly, Similarly, many words mark a person as a fool. In context, these proverbs mean that a fool seeks to advance themselves before God with great vows and promises. With these great dreams and big talk, there's little action. So when there's a solemn and sacred situation, the wise keep their words few. The fool can't help themselves. They babble on and on and on and on and everybody's wondering, when are they going to stop? In Proverbs 18.6, it says, a fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. (laughs) A fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are a snare to his soul. And then in Proverbs 17, 28, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise, which is a great thing if you (laughs) feel like you're a fool, you know, just keep it shut. Everybody will think you're wise. When he closes his lips, he's deemed intelligent. 
Better, as some people have said, better to be thought wise and keep your mouth shut than to open it and remove all doubt. (laughs) And so when we enter God's presence, we set aside our own business at the door. We set aside our own pride at the door, our sinful ways at the door, and we enter to worship a holy God. That's powerful. The second thing we see in verses four through seven is that the fear of the Lord um, is seen by the person that fulfills their promises to him. Not only do we fear God with our words in general, but also with promises or vows. And, And so in verse four, when you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. The whole idea of a vow is really strange to modern worshipers, that you would make a promise to God and then fulfill it. But we do see it a number of times in the Bible, and even in the New Testament, this word vow means to make a promise to God with consequences if the promise is not kept. Lord, I will, if you get me out of this situation, Lord, I will start going to church, I promise. You know, Lord, if you get me to Bible college, I'll go into ministry. I promise. You know, people still do this today, but don't realize how sacred those promises are. Worshippers would promise in those days to perform something for the Lord, offer something as a sacrifice, dedicate costly objects like a house or land to the Lord, um, and they could sell it and give money to the Lord. Maybe they would abstain from something like the um, the Nazarene that would the Nazarite vow they would not drink wine and they wouldn't touch anything dead and and so on. Um, a person could even vow himself to service of the Lord or promise to return something to the Lord, like Hannah. In 1 Samuel 1.11, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And that is the third promise of the Nazarite vow, by the way. But notice what Hannah is doing here. Lord, if you give me a son, then I will give him to you for your service. And that's exactly what she did. Her son's name was Samuel. And as a young boy, as soon as he was weaned, his mom took him there to the temple where he served with Eli. And God spoke to him there. It was pretty awesome. When you make a vow, it's always a promise to God. A vow is not a promise to a man, it's a promise to God. Um, It's never used as a promise between two human beings. In in Deuteronomy 23, it says, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay in fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You know, so you might be thinking, well, then why vow? (laughs) <laughs> it keeps you out of trouble. Well, a vow is an act of worship. You're willing to give to the Lord something that's costly, and it flows from a worshipful heart. It's an expression of devotion. It's an act of praise for answered prayer. Jacob vowed a vow. When he was running for his life from Esau, his brother, um, It says in Genesis 28, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will bring me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be his house or God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. 
and God did bring him back. And Jacob did complete that vow. But then we see tragic vows. If you know the story of Jephthah, God gave him victory in answer to his prayer against the Ammonites. And he said, God, if you give me victory, whatever is the first thing to come out of my house, I will offer it as a burnt offering to you. God gives him victory. He goes home and the first thing that comes out of his front door is his daughter. And now he realizes how tragic a thoughtless vow could be. Rash vows are to be avoided. In Proverbs 20, it says, it is a snare to say rashly it is holy and to reflect only after making vows. If you ever make a vow or a promise of any kind to God, it's serious stuff. And so make sure you think it through. And if you make it, don't de delay in paying it. It becomes first priority. After all, you just made a promise to God himself. He has no pleasure in fools, it says. You know, if you don't think it through, and then you want to pull out. Fools' mouths have a habit of writing checks that they're Lives can't cash. And so, it's no different for Christians. I want to read to you a story in the New Testament of a vow. In Acts chapter 5, but a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? That serious stuff. And to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. You see, he vowed the land and its proceeds to the Lord, but secretly kept some back. You can't fool God. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? You could have like made your vow, I'm going to give part of it to the Lord and part of it I'm going to go on a vacation to Hawaii or something, but it's not what he said. And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. And the young man rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval, about three hours, his wife came in and not knowing what had happened, Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And he, she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband, and great fear came upon the whole church, and all upon all who heard of these things. That's why it says it's better than not to vow, than to vow and not keep it, because there's accountability to the God you made a promise to. In verse six, let not your mouth lead you into sin and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? Why should you be like Ananias and Sapphira? Leaving a vow unfulfilled is a serious offense. And in this case, there is a messenger that comes knocking. When the vow was to be paid and it wasn't paid, a messenger comes. This word for messenger is someone natural or supernatural who carries a message and fulfills other representative functions. So what is it? A man or an angel? 
A messenger shows up. Well, I like to think of it this way. Who sent the messenger? Was it God or was it man? You know, is it the temple priests that send a messenger or is it God from heaven sending a messenger? Well, it could probably be either. But I tend to think in my own mind that a messenger from God in any form, that's who we're accountable to is God himself. God may send a messenger of any form, man or angel, and we will face accountability. And that accountability is destruction of some sort. Here it says destruction of, um, you know, the things that you've done with your hands. You know, the parts of your life that you've built might experience some sort of destruction. Well, if that doesn't put the fear of God in you, um, you know, I don't know what will. That's why it's in the Bible and it's in the New Testament. Ananias and Sapphira. And thank God he doesn't kill people like that all the time. You know, I mean, how many of us would be here today? I, I don't know. But he did it at the beginning of the church to make sure everybody knew he is a holy God. And that we should have a fear for him. And in verse 7, it wraps it up. For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one you must fear. So again, we're reminded of that idea of the fool whose big dreams lead to lots of words and promises that don't come about, don't come to fruition. But we need to fear the Lord. God is the one you must fear. And so the fearing of the Lord is this idea of reverential respect and and awe. It's the reality that one day you will answer to him. The fear of the Lord is offered as a guard against foolishness in Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This is where it starts, where you leave your foolishness behind, is when you enter the house of God and you say, God, you are a holy God. You are a transcendent God. You are a God who I will answer to. And so there begins wisdom. And you can see why. It impacts everything. The way you live at home, the way you live at work, the way... You function at church. And it says, and the knowledge one is of the Holy One is insight. The more we learn about what pleases Him. So I want to conclude with this. Worship the Lord with reverence and awe. <laughs> it's not just for the Old Testament believer. It is for the believer today. Yes, we have been washed clean and we have been forgiven and we've been given access into the throne room of God when Jesus died on the cross. But enter with reverence and awe. In Hebrews, I had a longer passage here, but spoke much longer than I thought I would, so... I'm going to read the last verse. It says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. And so in case we become too lighthearted towards the Lord, it is good to be reminded that we should honor him as holy. And we pray, Father, which is very intimate. Father, Abba. There's a closeness. But then we also have a heart that says, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. We talk much about the intimacy and that is so good. And, and it's probably, you know, just the, the center of your relationship with God. But a married to it should be an awe. And a wonder. Like when we take communion, there should be an awe in a wonder. 
And there is a warning in 1 Corinthians 11 that, uh, you know, if you eat in an unworthy manner, that you'll face some sort of judgment. That's some serious stuff, you know? And that's today. So, where's your heart with the Lord? If you've lost a sense of sacredness and a sense of holiness, then I want to encourage you today to maybe like the fool in this chapter, leave your shoes at the door. Take off the emptiness, the the pride, and enter your time with the Lord, whether it be prayer by yourself or worship in the church or life group together with a sense of awe and reverence. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a merciful God. And so many times, Lord, we maybe have conducted ourselves in ways that we haven't shown you the honor you deserve. And Lord, we know that this is not primarily outward about our clothes or other things, but it is about our heart. And so Lord, we pray today you might give us a heart of worship, of reverence, of awe. Lord, that we would place you in our minds again on the throne. Again, as high and lifted up and bigger than the universe. You are the God we worship. And and so, Lord, help us to rejoice in that. Enjoy your presence and be amazed every time we come close to you. So we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.